So good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I thought that it's normally uh, we would do Torah portion and today the book of Rus because Shruis is coming when the book, the Megillat Rus is read. But this morning, I think we have to talk for a few minutes about the terrible tragedy that happened in Iran. And what, what could you really say? What can you t- say about this story? What, what could you say? We, we don't understand it. It's, there's no reason that such a terrible thing should happen on one of the holiest days of the year, Lagba Omer, at the resting place of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, author of the Zohar, one of the greatest sages that ever lived. And there for good cause, good for reason. The unity, if you saw the videos, the unity of the of the people there is just not to be believed. The singing, just gorgeous, watching it and then suddenly seeing chaos. So I remember a story, Eli Weisel was asked, he was a good friend of my father. So they said to him, all other religions have a concept of silence. They meditate, they sit quietly, Jews, do we have any tradition of silence? We always have something to say, am I right? <laughs> when are we ever quiet? <laughs> they say, uh, one Jew, two opinions. <laughs> There's always, we're very opinionated people, thank God. So what did Eli Rizel respond? He says, of course we have a tradition of silence, but no one talks about it. <laughs> That's how silence. <laughs> Very cute. So uh, the the answers to life's uh, struggles are always found in the Torah. So I want to share something. This is my own personal insight. Um, uh, You know, I always try to think how what what resonates with me will hopefully resonate with everyone else. So a few weeks ago, we discussed another terrible tragedy that happened in the Torah, where Aaron's two sons are taken, remember, the fire comes down from heaven and they're burnt on the one of the happiest celebratory days ever, the, the dedication of the Mishkan, the dedication of the tabernacle. Suddenly, out of nowhere, they bring a foreign fire and we discussed all the reasoning behind it and they, the two sons of Aaron are taken. And look what happens. Moshe says to Aaron, I felt there was something going to happen, but I thought it was going to be to me or you. But it happened to your sons. They must be the greatest and holiest of Israel. And what does Aaron say? What's his response? Who remembers from that Torah portion? Vayidam Aaron. Aaron is silent. Now, you might want to analyze the psychology behind this. Why is he silent? His two sons, good morning, Kim. We're good morning. Terrible happening in Miron. We're trying to make yeah. a sense of our response. So why is Aaron silent? So if you're a psychiatrist, if your name is Shleimala Freud, you know, Sigmund Freud's Hebrew name was Shleimala, you might say tremendous anger, tremendous resentment. Sometimes you're so angry, you're so resentful, you're quiet, you're seething inside. But we know that's not true with Aaron. Because God comes and speaks to him. And the commentaries say, because Aaron was silent, God comes to him. Why? Maybe he's silent for a negative reason. But the silence of Aaron was not a silence of anger, resentment. It was a silence that said, I can't wrap my head around what happened to my sons. I cannot understand God's way because God is infinite and I'm finite. So silence in that moment was not silence because he's really seething, angry, and when he gets home, he's going to smash a case of dishes and, and, and curse the world. Silence because he realizes he cannot understand. So there's a, a beautiful story I read a while back, the Kleisenberger Rebbe. The Rebbe, there was a Rebbe from Kleisenberg in Poland, and he had 11 children, and the Nazis came, and 10 of his children were taken into the concentration camp, and his wife, and immediately cremated. 
One child survived, ended up in the DP camps, and passed away in the DP camps. They say the Kleisenberger Rebbe didn't even know that child was alive. And he comes to Israel, he rebuilds his entire life, he remarries, he built the same famous uh, Laniato Hospital, Kiryat Sands, that's all the Kleisenberger Rebbe. Rebuilt an entire empire of Judaism in Israel. And in, uh, and, and in New Jersey and all over, in many different places. And a Jew came to the Kleisenberger Rebbe one day and said, Rebbe, how, how did you do it? Your whole family, your wife, your 11 children wiped out by the Nazis. How did you pick yourself up? How did you have the strength after such tragedy, such loss? And the Kleisenberger Rebbe says to him the following words, Bedamayichayi, which means through blood you live. The fascist, he says to the Jew, you understand? So the Jew says, of course I understand. It means that when you go through blood, you go through tragedy, you go through pain, you go through suffering, that spurs you to rebuild. It gives you the energy to move forward sometimes. You know, there's two reactions to pain. One is you give up. And the other reaction to pain is you rebuild. So that Kleisenberger Rebbe says, nine, nine, no, no, that's not what I meant. But the mayach can mean with your blood, you live, but it could also mean with your silence. Like with Aaron, Vayidom Aaron, Aaron was silent. The Kleisenberger Rebbe said, with silence I live, which means that I know I cannot understand. I don't know how to understand the ways of God, why this should happen, how it could happen, why did God allow this to happen? So I lived my life with silence, meaning silence, acknowledging there are no words for this pain and suffering. There are no words for this tragedy in my life. There are no words for the 45 who, who were taken in Iran. There's no words. We cannot wrap our heads around it. So sometimes... The approach has to be just the acknowledgement that we do not know. We do not know. We cry. We call out for justice from God. We're not silent that we don't care, but we're silent in our attitude that we don't understand. So perhaps, again, I cannot, I don't understand, so I cannot come here with rationale. The only thing we can draw is on from the Torah and from what we know about God, that God is infinite. So before we go into the book of Rus, I just want to share with you a beautiful story. My brother, Yosef Yitzhak Jacobson, he's known as YY, he's a lecturer. So he went, uh, uh, Sunday was my father's yard site. So we all met in the old Montefiore uh, cemetery where the Rebbe is, is and my father. And afterwards, I see my brother is hitching a ride with somebody to Borough Park. <laughs> so why are you going to Borough Park? He says, I'm going to pay a shiva call to one of the families who lost a son in Miron. And he told me what happened. He couldn't believe it, he said. The father tells him like this, my son is a chassan, he's engaged. My daughter is getting married in a few weeks. So we said to him, don't go back to Eretz Yisrael, stay home. You're getting married right after the summer. Your sister's getting married in a few weeks. What do you need to spend the money and go back to Eretz Yisrael, learn here in yeshiva? Why are you going back? The father didn't want him to go back. The son insisted, no, Tati, I want to go back to yeshiva. I want to go back to yeshiva. You're getting married. Your sister's getting married. He was so insistent. Father bought him a ticket, drove him to JFK as he's driving him, bringing him there. He says, Ta, I want to tell you the real reason I'm going back. I want to be by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in Miron on Lag Omer. I don't want to miss it. His father says to him, had you told me this before, I would have never bought you a ticket. <laughs> I would have never let you go. He said his son went and his son never came back. Ugh. Why? He doesn't know. Why? He doesn't know. He doesn't know. And that's the thing. He doesn't know why. But every family has another story. One more story. My brother then went to another home. 
to be Ishpei Shiva. And there the father told him another crazy story. His son was at the Miron and he twisted his ankle. So Tatsala was called in. This is before the tragedy. And they lifted him out on a stretcher. And he's on the outskirts. He's feeling better. He decides to go back. And he goes back and he doesn't come out. His father said, could you explain that to me? He called me from Iran. He said, Dad, I twisted my ankle. So I'm out here. I'm not really in the center of things. And then we found that later he went back in. So what is our response? Our response has to be, I think, we don't know what, the, we don't have a response. There's no explanation. And there's no one to blame. <laughs> Usually we have somebody to blame, somebody to say, we don't have an answer. So what I thought to myself is what I have to do is strengthen my own goodness, be better, be nicer, be more charitable, be more helpful, be kinder, do more, re-strengthen my connection to God, to Torah, to mitzvahs. That's my own personal resolution for this terrible tragedy because there's no response other than that. But to do something in the memory of these souls, some food for thought, things we could think about. So does anybody want to say anything, add anything before we go into the book of Ruth? Feel free, don't be shy. Okay, so let's now go into one of the most beautiful stories, one of the most powerful stories, the book of Rus. The book of Rus. Now, when do we read the book of Rus? Who knows? We read it on the holiday of Shavuos, Megillat Rus. Why? Anybody know why? We read Megillat Esther on the holiday of Purim, and we read the story of Rus, the book of Rus, on the holiday of Shavuos. Anybody want to guess or know or say? So the answer, anybody? Kim? But you're on mute. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. Sorry, I want to, sorry. Um, I think it's because we're given the Torah on Shavuos yes. and Ruth is a convert and Correct. therefore she's accepting the Torah. This is what I'm guessing. Oh, so yeah. we read the book of Ruth because she, the Ruth is the convert's name for a woman that converts to Judaism and gives her life to Torah. Very good. So based on what Kim said is one of the reasons we read it as Ruth who's a convert, accepts Torah with such dedication and such love, how much more so someone who's born Jewish should follow her example of dedication and acceptance of Torah. So that's one, another, one reason we read the book of Rus. Another reason, a simple reason is, it, the story took place during this time of year, during Shruis, harvest. The Jews would harvest and bring Bikurim, the first of the fruit to the Beit HaMikdash, even though this was before the Beit HaMikdash. Another reason we read the story, who is Ruth the great-great-grandmother of? Roberta, you were saying? King David. King David. David HaMelech, who was born and passed away on Shuas. So already this gives you an insight into the story. She is the great grandmother of David HaMelech, King David. So here's a few reasons this happened during the time of Shavuos. She's the great grandmother of David HaMelech who's pivotal to the story. And it also gives us an insight of her love and dedication to Torah, even though she didn't have to be dedicated. She wasn't born Jewish. How much more so we who are born into the Jewish faith. Our born Jewish should have a love and dedication to Torah equal to Ruth, if not more. So now we're going to start the story. It is a story filled with a lot of controversy. It's a story filled with a lot of questions. Not only questions in the story, but questions to our lineage, to our heritage. 
it's filled with a lot of, lot of innuendo. So when you read the Megillah, you really cannot only read it, you have to analyze it and study it because there's a lot happening here. So to start, I'm going to tackle the story of Rus. What happens to her? And then we're going to backtrack to what happens before she becomes the Jewish Rus. So we're going to start with her now, the opening, and I'm going to read pieces from the Megillah because I feel it's very important that we should hear it as it's written. Okay? So let's start with the story. And if anybody wants to help me with the story, it's fine. Okay, let's begin. So there's a very wealthy guy called Eli Melech. This is taking time during the, let me give you also historical context. This is taking time during the time of the Shoftim, the judges. The Jews are living in Israel, but they have not yet built the Beit HaMikdash. Okay? Time of the judges. There's a famine in the land of Israel. One of the wealthiest people, Eli Melech, who's married to the famous Naomi, decides he's going to leave the land of Israel. It's too challenging. Everybody's coming to him for money. He's losing his money. He doesn't want to lose his dignity and self-respect. He doesn't have faith in the land of Israel. So he takes his wife, Naomi, his two sons, Machlon and Kilion, and they trek to the land of, anybody know? Moab. Moab. I was going to say that, Moab. <laughs> okay. Now, what's wrong with the country of Moab? If you go back in history, when the Jewish people left Egypt, anybody remember the story what happened with Moab? Roberta, you want to fill us in? Uh, you can't go to Moab. Not a good place. They okay. were very um, inhospitable. Right. They were cruel. How do we see it? They were unhospitable, cruel people. When the Jews left Egypt, and you're not talking about a little caravan with one horse and buggy, you're talking about over 600,000 people that had to travel through foreign countries and foreign territories. And most of those countries and territories let them pass because they saw what happened in Egypt. They read on the news, they saw on the internet. They weren't gonna get plagued. <laughs> but when it came, and, and the Jews would buy food and equipment and supplies in these countries, right? In these territories. Comes that they come to Amnam and Moab and they ask for safe passage through the land and they go, absolutely not. And they not only that, they don't want to sell them any food or water or anything. They were known to have the DNA of being unhospitable, mean hearted people, except for their women their women secretly smuggled out food and water and supplies for the Jewish people. They didn't listen to the men, the Moabite women. You'll see why this is very important. So God made a declaration. You may not marry a Ammonite or a Moabite. Male, a male though, not a female, a male, because the females, as we said, were kind, they were generous. So that's the story of Moab. Now let's continue the story. So Naomi, Elimelech, and their two sons end up in Moab. And Machlon and Kilion each marry M Moabite princesses. You know, what's the name of that famous book now? Uh, China Rich, about the very wealthy. <laughs> oh, the rich, crazy Asians. Yeah. Okay, so they marry two aristocratic Royals, Ruth marries Machlon, and Arpa, Ruth's sister, marries Kilion. Okay, so Naomi now has two daughter-in-laws. There's a question whether they convert or not. Some say they did convert, some say they didn't convert, but the two sons marry these two girls. And tragedy strikes. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, passes away. He dies. Next, a few years later, Machlon dies, and then Kilion dies. So the three husbands, the father and the two sons are gone. 
Naomi is left penniless with two of her daughter-in-laws. So let's hear what happens. What does she say to them? Now, Naomi is a very special woman. She realizes that this is not just accidental. This is not just a coincidence. She realizes that there was a sin here. Her husband had no business deserting his people, deserting his land. He should have stuck it out during the famine. He left, and this was, she realized, a punishment from God. So she says to herself, time to go back to the land of Israel. I don't want to perpetuate what happened here. I want to return. I want to make good. And she starts to pack her bags to go back to the land of Israel. And this is what she tells to her daughter-in-laws. Three times she discourages them from returning with her. That's how we get the law that someone wants to convert. Three times you have to push them away and discourage them. So Naomi says to her daughter-in-laws, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons, sons in my womb that they should be your husbands? And she says again, return my daughters. I am too old to marry. Even if I had a husband tonight, and even if I had born sons, what would you do? Wait for them to grow up? Would you shut yourselves off for the world and not marry? No, my daughters, it's too bitter for me and for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone against me. Okay, so she says to them, why are you coming with me? What do you see? There's no future with me. I'm penniless. I'm poverty ridden. I'm going back to it to the country where I have nothing because my husband left nothing there for me. Stay here. Go back to your tati. Go back to your dad. Go back to the palace. You have wealth here. You have prestige here. What are you going to come with me? An old lady, an old hag. <laughs> what are you going to go with me? <laughs> she puts herself down. I don't mean in a derogatory way, but she's painting a picture of there's no hope with me. So this is very pivotal in the story, what happens. So Arpa and Rus are accompanying their mother-in-law. It says they walked for 40 steps. And during these 40 steps, there's a tremendous psychological trauma going on here. The, the daughter-in-law, Arpa, is contemplating, should she go with Rus or not? Should she go with Rus or not? So she's walking with her, and the Torah says 40 steps, which is really not really a large amount of steps, but 40 steps. And let's see what happens. Who decides to stay? Who decides to go? Anybody know? Owen. Who goes? Rus, who stays? Arpa. So look what happens. And they raised their voices and they wept. And Arpa kisses her mother-in-law and Ruth, Ruth cleaves to her mother-in-law. So Naomi says to Ruth, go. Your sister-in-law and your sister has returned to her people. Go after her, go with her. And Ruth says the most famous words. I love it the most beautiful poetic words that you could ever manage, manage. This is what she says. Do not entreat me to leave you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. The most beautiful words spoken by Rus. And I'm gonna read it to you in Hebrew. Good morning. The famous words of Rus, the famous, most poetic, beautiful words. Good morning, Judith. That Hi. anyone can ever say. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Phil, you were talking about the book of Ruth. We just started with the story. Right. Continues. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. 
So may the Lord do to me and may he continue. And if anything but death separates me and you. So let's go back one more time. So Arpa kisses her mother-in-law. Rus cleaves to her mother-in-law. See the difference? What's the difference? Explains the difference here. And the Torah, the Talmud tells us for the four kisses, Arpa was rewarded for four powerful sons. And the 40 steps, we're going to discuss later what was her reward for the 40 steps that she took with Naomi. Now, this is before Sigmund Freud. This is before all the psychoanalysts and the psychologists discussing. But you see, Arpa is walking with her mother-in-law. She doesn't know what to do. Should she go with her mother-in-law to a life of poverty, back to Israel, uncertain? Or should she stay and go back to the palace, to the wealth, to the riches? And she decides to stay. And later on, I'm not going to address it now, later on, part two, we're going to distress what happens, what are the psycho psychological ramifications, because it's a terrible tragedy what happens to her psychologically. So what does it mean, Ruth cleaves and Arpa kisses? You ever met a friend, they give you a peck on the cheek, how are you, honey? And they leave. And then there's a friend that gives you a hug and embrace. And that hug is real, authentic. The person is with you, they're staying with you. That's what's showing here. Arpa gave her mother-in-law four kisses. Bye, Mamala. Yes, you're right, I gotta go back home. This life of poverty is not for me. This life of Judaism, uncertain is not for me. Ruth says, no, no, this is absolutely what I'm gonna do. And she cleaves to her mother-in-law. She hugs her mother-in-law. She embraces her mother-in-law. And she goes back with her mother-in-law. The different type of approaches to what's happening. There's the cleaver and the kisser. Person who cleaves, authentic, a hug, an embrace that's real. I'm staying with you through thick or thin. And there's, oh, you're going there? No, thank you. Okay, goodbye. See you later. <laughs> You're not interested. You give a kiss. Wait, can you just back up? Can you yes. just back oh, up a second? Yes. I'm trying to understand the whole situation. I understand what you're saying, but who's yes. doing what? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that very yes. quickly? So I'm the sorry. Torah tells us that Arpa kisses her mother-in-law goodbye, and Ruth, Ruth cleaves to her mother-in-law. This is what it says in the Torah passage. This Got it. And it is that cleaving that the commentaries and the Kabbalah Hasidic Jewish mysticism explains the different attitudes of the two daughter-in-laws and the two sisters. This is how we understand what's going on with them psychologically also. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to explain because it's, this is, uh, is gonna be part two. I wanna move on with the story so we don't lose momentum. Then we'll go back to what happens to Arpa because there's a lot that happens. It's, it's, it's mind boggling, but let's move on with the story because this story is also mind boggling. So now they come back to the land of Israel and they are like beggars. They look, they look poor and people mock them. This is the Naomi that left in with a, with, a, with a coach with four white horses. Look at her now, look at her now. And who's this Rus, the Moabite with her, her daughter-in-law, the Moabite. So there for a few, while they're a little bit a source of mockery. But you know how it is on page six of the New York Post. Soon people lose interest in the gossip. They lose interest in, the, there's another story that comes their way. And Rus and Naomi settle into a very poor life. The lands of Elimelech have been mortgaged and taken over by actually by his nephew, Boaz, who was one of the judges and one of the richest men living in Israel at the time, because the famine is now over. So Rus, though she comes from very regal beginnings, right? She's a princess. She might not be a Jewish princess, but she's a royal. She's used to, she's used to living with luxury. She says to her mother-in-law, I'm going to go to the fields and collect food for us. We're not going to starve. Now, there's a beautiful, beautiful law in Jewish life in Israel. 
how do you provide for the poor in a dignified manner? So there's no handouts in a sense. It's called shichicha peyan lekat. During harvest time, the landowner is collecting all the bundles of wheat. Circle. Go ahead. You know, you know about it, Diane? You want to share? So what happens is shichicha. Well, what I remember is that harvest. Tell us, tell us. You harvest the circle so the corners are left unharvested so people can come and collect food. Is that That's right? The, peya, the corner, very good. And then there's leket and the shechecha. So shechecha means forgot. The landowner, they're piling up the wagons with wheat bundles or barley bundles, and they leave some bundles behind. They're not permitted to go back and get them. They have to leave it for the people who need it. And the last thing is leket, bundles fall off the wagon. Those are meant for collection again. You don't go back and take them. You leave it for the poor people. So Rus, among the other poor, has no, doesn't say it's beyond, it's below my dignity. She goes and she is collecting every day she goes. And where does she end up? On whose field of all the fields in the land of Israel? Boaz, who happens to be her first cousin. She doesn't know it at the time. Divine providence, she ends up at the most wealthiest landowner's field, Boaz. And every day he notices all the maidens and all the people coming. And he notices one girl. Why does she stand out? Because she, there's a certain inner dignity and aristocracy that she has. The Torah even describes, even the way she bent down to pick up. She never bent over. She always bent down very graciously in a very modest way. So he notices her and he makes inquiries. Who is that girl? Who is that woman? And they tell her, oh, her the Moabite. <laughs> Ruth the Moabite. She's Naomi's daughter-in-law. You know what happened. The two husbands died, blah, blah, blah. They tell the story. So he indirectly makes sure she gets extra and he indirectly sends some food over and Naomi discusses this with Ruth. She says, where are you getting all the stuff? She says, I'm at this guy's field. And they find, she finds out it's Boaz, her nephew, her husband's brother's son. And now Naomi, who I mentioned before, is a very holy, special woman, had a sense of prophecy and intuition that there's something behind the scenes going on over here. There is the hand of God over here. So she hatches a unbelievable plan. This is the plan. Now she knows harvest season is going to come to an end. Once harvest season is coming to an end, Rus is not going to be going to the fields every day. So it's now or never. She has to take action. She knows something must transpire here with Rus. So she hatches this unbelievable plan. She sits Rus down. She says, Rus, the harvest season is coming to an end. There's going to be a year, like a celebration, end of harvest. And there is something you have to take care of, you have to do. So listen and follow my instructions exactly what I tell you to do. Let me read what she tells her, because it's very fascinating. You ready? Okay. Hold on, I, I, I want to read it straight from the text. So I want to get my notes out. Give me a second, where is it? Ah, oh, here it is. Okay, ready? And now she tells her, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm condensing it a little bit. Is not Boas our kinsman? Okay, below, behold, he's going to be winnowing the threshing floor of the barley tonight. You shall bathe and anoint yourself, put on your clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man, to Boaz, until he has finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that you shall know where he lies. You shall come and uncover his feet. Listen to this crazy story. <laughs> and lie down. And then he will tell you what you shall do. 
So what does Ruth say to Naomi? Now, now, I want you to envision this. Who here has a daughter-in-law? Anybody? Imagine, okay, go ahead, Diane. You tell your daughter-in-law, darling, Rusala, sit down. I want you to go tonight when Boaz is finishing his threshing. And I want you to wait till he finishes celebrating the eating and the drinking. And when he goes back, because at that time, by the way, just a little information, the plantation owners or what you call the landowners would stay in the fields with their people till harvest season was over. That's how they ran the show. That's how they ran their businesses. So when he lies down in his barn or warehouse and you go, be all dressed up and anointed and clean, lie down near him, uncover his feet, and then he's going to tell you what he's going to tell you. This is what Naomi tells Russ. Now, let me ask you, what would be your response to this? If you were the daughter-in-law, um, Shrigger, <laughs> thank you very much, but I, I don't even know what that this is. What's going on over here? <laughs> what do you want? What? He's going to, who knows his reaction? He'll have me arrested. What, and also, you know, she's known for her modesty. This doesn't seem like a very modest thing to do. Right, even though Boaz at the time was a widow, he had he was eighty years old. He had just lost his wife. The Torah tells us, but it's a little bit hair-brained idea. And and really, what is going on over here? So, what do you think is what's the plan? What's behind the scenes? Who would like to share what they think the plan is? Speculate. Nothing happens if you're wrong. <laughs> Go ahead, Diane. Kim, we want to speculate what's going on over here. Judith, anybody? Roberta, <laughs> go ahead. He's relaxed. He's yeah. eating, so he's satisfied. Yeah, good. <laughs> he may be open to new ideas because he's eaten and he's relaxed and he's lying down and maybe she rubs his feet. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So it's a romantic gesture? It's a, she's, so let me ask you, if Naomi's trying to make a shidduch here, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match, shouldn't she go find a local matchmaker, say, Yenta, do me a favor, like in Fiddler on the Roof, go to Boaz, tell him, you know, have I got a girl for you, <laughs> have I got a girl for you, <laughs> why, why doesn't she do that? Why not set a matchmaker to him? You have an idea, uh, you know? Isn't that a better way, a more dignified way, a more respectful way, maybe a more successful way of getting What's going on? So you know to tell the story of a guy. So the matchmaker sets the girl up with a guy. She goes out with the guy and they're sitting in the house and she comes running out to the matchmaker. She says, well, why did you lie to me? You told me he's tall, he's short. You told me he's slim and fit, he's chubby and fat. You told me he's intelligent, he can't put two sentences together. You know, why'd you lie to me? Why'd you lie to me? And now she, the girl realized he's gonna overhear and she says, and now he's gonna overhear everything I said. So the matchmaker said, don't worry, he's also deaf. <laughs> 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 so so why doesn't naomi say let me send a representative you know boaz is one of the richest guys he's a show fate he's a judge he's not like he's not a, a simple guy walking around he's one of the richest landowners shouldn't she send a matchmaker somebody to speak to him and say boaz boy russ amazing a modest girl a dedicated girl, a beautiful girl, a beautiful woman. She, she hatches a plan. And Rus, you know, sometimes you can hatch a plan and what does your child say to you? Ma, you're nuts. Ta, you're crazy. You think I'm gonna do that? Sometimes the person stands up. Good morning, Dory, good morning. And the person stands up and says, listen, you, you might think this is a plan, but no thank you, okay? So now let's see what actually happens and why it has to happen this way. Let's go into the story. So let's see what happens and then we'll discuss who, what, why. 
So Rus does just that. She bathes, she anoints, she gets dressed. She waits for Boaz to finish threshing, winnowing, whatever they call it. And he eats, he drinks, he lies down. She comes in quietly, uncovers, lies down, uncovers his feet and stays there. Now let's see what happens. Let's see the reaction. Amazing what the reaction is. The Emtsa Halayla, in the middle of the night. And it came to pass at midnight, and the man quaked, quaked, which means he shook, and was taken around, and behold, a woman was lying at his feet. This reads like a Harry Potter novel. <laughs> Listen to this. <laughs> and he says to her, Boa says to Rus, who are you? And she said, I am Rus, your handmaid, and you shall spread your skirt over your handmaid, for you are a near kinsman. Also very important, near kinsman, means you're related to me, very important. And he says, listen what he says to her. What do you think he says to her? Let's everybody guess. Roberta, what does he say to her? Avec, Arois. <laughs> what does he say to her, Roberta? We're she coming right. to the controversial she part. Right to come. She you said, go ahead. Reminded him that there was Yibum and I'd be fine. Right. And I think the feet is symbolic of that. Beautiful. You, you'll, can you elaborate for us in a second? All right, I'll try. Okay, because most people here don't know what Yibum is. Very, very good. So we have here a, a Torah scholar, Roberta. She says, he was glad she was there. Very good. Who else has a reaction? Margaret, what do you think Boa says to Rus? Dory, Marcy, Rachel, Judith, anybody? Kim? Kim, what would you say? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, listen to what he says. And he said, may you be blessed, my daughter. Your latest act of kindness is greater than the first. Not to follow the young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. All that you say, I will do for you. For the entire gate of my people know that you are a valiant woman. And now, indeed, I am a kinsman. But there is a kinsman closer than I. Stay over tonight. It will come to pass in the morning. And if he redeems you, he will redeem you. But if he does not, I will redeem you. And she lay at his feet until morning and she rose and, and so on and so forth. And then she goes back to Naomi and she tells her everything that transpired. But before she goes back, Boaz gives her six barleys he says, do not go empty handed back to your mother-in-law. And she said, Naomi says to her, sit down still my daughter until you know how the matter will fall for the man will not rest until he has resolved the matter today. Okay. So now let's go into this. So just to rehash, so everybody knows we're all on the same page. So what's Boaz's reaction to this girl, this woman at his feet? He says to her, your kindness that you did today is even greater than all the previous kindness. So what does that mean? What is he talking about? We're gonna go into that very, very controversial topic. And he says to her, you know, that there's another relative that's closer to you than me. Remember, Boaz is her first cousin, right? Elimelech's brother was Boaz's father. So now let's explain what Roberta said. So you, we have context, and now we're gonna go into this very, very unbelievable insight. So first of all, why couldn't Naomi send a matchmaker? Let's answer that question right away. Because what do you think Boaz would have said? He might have dismissed it. That's Epis. Why would I marry Rus? What's, what's going on? He might have dismissed it. He may not have been understood the power behind the story, behind the power of the story, behind understanding what really has to happen. But when she came in such a dramatic way, lie down on his feet, uncovered his feet, he realized this is no coincidence. This is divine providence. God is sending me a message. 
which is also a very interesting thing. Boaz was a very special person. So was Ruth, so was Naomi. How many times opportunities present ourselves and we dismiss them? It was a coincidence. Oh, I did this, so this happened. What do we think? The hand of God is in everything that happens in my life. Ah, Ababa Misa. We sometimes are dismissive of things that happen in our lives because we don't realize. Sometimes it's so outrageous, we say to ourselves, it's outrageous. This could not be the hand of Hashem. It's, it happened upon me. It's too outrageous for me to, to have to take this seriously. Or we're very dismissive of things because we're not tuned in to th that every single thing that happens to us is the hand of Hashem. And it's happened for a reason. Like we discussed a few weeks ago, how the, the leaf falls off the tree, covers the worm because the worm was hot. That even a fallen leaf from a tree is divine providence. So carpe diem, when something comes your way, you have to seize the moment, even if it's trivial, because you never know, did God put me on this world so that I could give that person the $25 that they asked for? So that I could deliver a pie to a woman in her last moments of her life? You never, never know. So when an opportunity presents itself, you must seize it. This is what it's telling us here. So now let's go back. This is one of the things telling us how every opportunity realizes that we have to realize that sometimes, I don't want to use the word craziest moment, but the craziest moments are the best moments. <laughs> you, know, you know, there were two, uh, it reminds me of a story, there were two beggars who used to sit and beg. That was what they did for a living in, in the shtetl. So the bond beggar says to his fellow beggar, you know what, let's move out of this shtetl to a bigger shtetl. More business there. More opportunity for begging, for schnodding. <laughs> so the, the, the other beggar says, yeah, listen, I can move, but I got to ask my Rebbe. <laughs> Rebbe, before I move another shtetl, to be a schnodder or a beggar in another shtetl, I need to ask my Rebbe. So he says, what do you need to ask the Rebbe? Why do you need to ask the Rebbe if you could go beg in another city? He says, because crazy I am, but that crazy I'm not. <laughs> he says, I might be crazy, but not so crazy not to ask my Rebbe for permission. So we have to, even moments in our lives that we seem like, how could this be anything? It is something. So now let's see what's going on here. So the commentaries explain that there is a, 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 a mitzvah in the Torah that's a very, very strange, okay? What's this mitzvah? It's called, as Roberta said, Roberta, say it again. Yibum, which means in English, leverite, a leverite marriage. What's a leverite marriage? Okay, there's a law. A man marries when a woman. You... Somebody could explain it? Liberta, you want to explain what a leverite marriage is? Go ahead. Marriage is as if a um, a woman is left a widow without married, children. The, the, the nearest kin is got to be husband. So, the, so she can make sure that the, the woman gives birth to a child in the name of the, the original husband. Very good. So to repeat, a woman is married to a Jewish man, a Jewish couple. The husband dies. They didn't have children. So that means his lineage, his name, his, his heritage is not Levon. So the next closest relative could be a brother, could be a cousin, could be an uncle, could be a father-in-law, as we'll soon see, is obligated to marry her. Now, let's say she doesn't like him or he doesn't like her. They don't have to, but they have to do something called chalitza, which calls the removal of the shoe, which I'll explain in a minute. So leverite marriage means the next of kin marries the girl, usually a brother, but again, it could be a cousin. Who is the next of kin to Boaz's husband, Machlon? I mean, to Ruth's husband, Machlon? Seemingly Boaz. But then they find out, no, there's another guy called Tav. He is really closer related to Machlon. So that's what Boaz says to her. 
if if Tav, who's a closer kinsman to you, does not want to marry you and fulfill the Leverite mitzvah of marriage, then I'll do it. But let's first we have to approach him because that's the law. So what's the uncovering of the feet? It's symbolic that when somebody doesn't want to marry the next of kin, whether it's the woman or the man, because she said, well, I don't like you. I don't want to marry my brother-in-law. And the brother-in-law might say, I don't want to marry her. Or the next of kin might say, well, I don't want to marry. Or she might say, I don't want to marry that guy. You're not forced. But if you don't end up marrying the person, there's a ceremony you do in the rabbinical court, which is involved called chalitza, removal of the shoe. You go to the rabbinical court and the guy says, I don't want to marry her. Or she says, I don't want to marry her. So she takes off the shoe, she unties the shoe, the shoe, the special rabbinical shoe is taken off and she says something and Pater Amaisa, he doesn't have to marry her and she doesn't have to marry him. This is why she uncovers her, his feet in a very modest, sophisticated way. She's telling him, you're the next of kin. The lineage has to live on. Oh, and he says oh, to her, I get it. You understand what's going on over here? Everybody clear? Any questions? The plot thickens. This is not it. Why does he have to marry her is the question. Why does Naomi go to such drastic measures to make sure that there is going to be a marriage between Boaz and Rus? That is really one of the most pivotal questions of the story. So everybody clear till now what happens. So let's finish off what happens and then we'll go back to what really is going on here. So Boaz wakes up in the morning. Remember, he's a judge. He goes before Tav and says, Tav, you know, you're next in line. You have to marry Rus. Tav says, no, thank you. I don't need any trouble. I'm not interested in marrying into a Moabite. Even though, what's the law that we discussed before? A Moabite convert woman, you're allowed to marry. A Moabite man, even if he doesn't convert, you can, even if he converts, you cannot marry. A lot of people in the land of Israel forgot the laws. They said a Moabite, no interest. No one is allowed to marry, male or female. So Boaz in front of the rabbinical judges clarifies the law and he declares and he says, remember everybody that a Moabite female convert you can marry, not a Moabite male convert. So now the law is clarified for the people. They had forgotten the law. Now Tav says, I don't want to marry her. Don't give me trouble. I don't need a Moabite. So who marries her now? Boaz. Boaz marries her now. Let's see what happens. Oh. Anybody knows what happens? So they have a beautiful marriage, wedding night together, intimate. The Torah tells us, 80 years old and she becomes pregnant immediately. And the next day, Boaz dies. What does the community say? What would you say? What would People Magazine write about this story? Ah, you see, he got punished. He killed him. <laughs> He's dead. He passed away. Ah, see, she never married her. But no, Kabbalah Hasidus explains this is the moment that he was waiting for, his mission on earth. Rus had to come, marry him, and I'll tell you why in a minute. She had to get pregnant and have a baby with him, even though he didn't live to see his son. And then he passes away because his shlichus, his mission is done. It's time for him to go. That's why he passes away. Not because God forbid he's punished. He fulfilled what he was meant to fulfill. He had to do this final mitzvah on earth, passes away. And she gives birth to, I mean, I want to, I want to read the lineage so you know what's going on here. She gives birth to a son she called Oved, which means serve God, who gives birth to Yishai, Jesse. Who does Jesse give birth to? King David David Hamelech. Now, so they had, they had to conceive the lineage of King David. Wait, the plot thickens. Who is Boaz's great parents? This is like really mind boggling. Who does Boaz come from? Anybody know? 
Boaz is the grandson, the great grandson of Judah, Judah of the 12 tribes, who gave birth to twins with Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Peretz and Zerach, and Boaz comes from Peretz. Now, both Ruth and Boaz come from very controversial lineage. And I want to share with you this so you understand what's going on here. And then the, the plot even thickens more. Why does King David come from, you would say, why doesn't he come from pure blood lineage? Why make it a controversial Boaz is coming from a relationship between Judah, Yehuda, and Tamar, a father-in-law and a daughter-in-law, which was permissible, by the way. It was before the giving of the Torah. And Ruth is a convert, a Moabite. God couldn't find a more meyuchesdika girl for Boaz. <laughs> find her a blue, a, blue, a blue blood Jewish girl. You know, maybe the daughter of another judge, maybe the daughter of a rabbi. Shouldn't two dynasties have pure lineage? And then King David comes from this very lily white lineage. Look at this controversy. A Moabite great grandmother. Even though she converts, Boaz, who comes from a relationship between Yehuda and Tamar, who we're going to talk about, and let's go back in time. Where are the Moabites from? Who knows? Where are the Moabites from? Where are the Moabites from? How is the first child called Moab born? Let's go back. Remember Sodom, the the nephew of. Abraham ends up in Sodom, a corrupt country, and Lot becomes the chief justice of Sodom. And he has two daughters. And God sends the angels to destroy Sodom. And they come out of Sodom. The wife turns to salt. Remember the story? And they end up in a cave. Lot and the two daughters. And the two daughters said, this is like the marble. The entire world has been destroyed. The entire world is gone. What are we going to do? How are we going to populate the earth? So Lot's oldest daughter had, gets Lot drunk and conceives a child, a boy with him. And what does she call him? Moa from my father. Ruth is a descendant of that incestuous relationship. Rus, the great great grandmother of David Amalach. Now, Lod's daughter is lauded in the Torah on self sacrifice to repopulate the world. She does something unthinkable. She is intimate with her father, she has a relationship with her father. So, Kabbalah, that's why you need Kabbalah and Hasidus to explain this. That there, first of all, the Torah could have hidden this story from us. You know, let's put it under the rug. Why talk about it? It's, it's a yeah. The Torah is telling us the self-sacrifice of Lot's daughter. She, she, she almost shamed herself to, to populate the world. But she realized that there's a greater purpose that she has. She has a mission and she has to do it. Whether It's not how she looks. It's what has to be done to survive and rebuild the world. So she's lauded for it by the Torah. Fast forward now comes Rus, who's a descendant of Moab, right? Of this relationship of Lot, who now comes into Israel and marries Boaz. And they give birth to the, the son who's going to be the great, 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 uh, right, Oved. Sorry, I got brain freeze here. Hold on. Oved, Yishai, and David. Now let's see who Boaz comes from. Another controversial story. Remember Judah from the 12 tribes? Yehuda, the, okay? He's living in the land of Israel. This is after the story of Yosef. And he has two, three sons, Or, Onain, and Shayla. Or marries a beautiful girl called Tamar. And Or dies. Now Tamar is a widow. There's no child. So what happens next? Leverite marriage. The brother 
Onain marries her. He wants to. She's beautiful. She's holy. She's a, she's a, she's a fantastic young lady. And he too dies. So now there's a third son. So what does Yehuda the father say? I'm not letting my third son marry her. The same thing's going to happen to him. I already lost two boys to this unlucky lady. And he doesn't let her marry Shayla. So she's in limbo. Now she's married. And now he performed the lever right, the chalitza. So she's kind of in limbo now. So she hatches a plan. She knows that she has to give birth to a child from the tribe of Judah. She knows in her mind that a future king will be born from her. But she's coming up to a brick wall. Yehuda won't let her marry his third son, who she's supposed to have a child with. So what does she do? She knows Yehuda's traveling. She dresses up in different type of clothes, like almost like a harlot. And on the road where he's traveling, he sees a beautiful woman. She's disguised. He takes her. They're intimate. And she becomes pregnant with him. So people come when it becomes noticeable. They go to Yehuda, who's a leader of the Jewish people. Your daughter was pregnant. She committed adultery because she's supposed to marry Shayla. She's in limbo. So she's Nishtahin and Nishtahar, according to, even though the Torah wasn't given yet, they did follow the Torah and mitzvahs, even though they didn't officially have it yet. So Yehuda says, so they said she has to be put to death. So they bring her to the rabbinical court to give her her sentencing. And she says, I have three gifts from the man who was the father of my child. Please let him know. Yehuda had given her in payment, thinking she was a harlot, a staff, a seal and a cloak, like a signet ring. When she pulls out the three items at the court case, he sees it and he says to the, to the people in the, the jury, she, I am the father of this child. And she becomes obviously free and she's married to Yehuda now. By the way, why did the two sons die? The Torah tells us because they refused to have children with Tamar. They spilled their seed. They said she's so gorgeous, she's so beautiful, like a model. If she becomes pregnant, she'll become big, she'll become, her stomach will stretch. It was vanity. So they were punished, that's why they died, because they refused to allow her to become pregnant with their seed, even though they had to. That was the destiny. Tamar had to have a child from the tribe of Yehuda to give birth to King David in the future generations. You see what's going on over here? There's a plan a godly plan that has to happen. And next week we're going to discuss why, why have the King of Israel born through what we look at as very controversial, maybe even tainted situation here. I'll give you a hint, from darkness comes the greatest light. That's the hint, based on Kabbalistic insights, Hasidus. So let's just finish the story. So Boaz is a descendant of the twins who are born from Tamar and Yehuda. Peretz and Zerach. Ruth is a descendant of the Lot relationship with his daughter, Moab. And together they give birth to a son, Oved, who gives birth to a son, Yishai, Jesse, who gives birth to a son, King David. And he becomes the first king, official king. The Shoal becomes the first king of Israel. So love just, it. Right, it's, a, it's a wild story. I when, love that. When we were kids, we were, you know, we were told it was like a little romance. She meets Boaz, he marries her. We don't know the whole behind the scenes. So just to sum up, the self-sacrifice of Ross, the kind, also, you know, the whole stories are really about love and kindness. Her dedication to her mother-in-law, her kindness in collecting food, even though she was a princess in a sense. Her, her, her lack of arrogance. She's a humble person, Russ. What would you say if you came from prince? Excuse me, I'm a princess. I may not be a princess right now, but you know, my father is Moab. None of that in the story. None of that. Humility, 
kindness, compassion for her mother-in-law. And also look how she, humility in going to do what her mother-in-law tells her. She could say, Naomi, you know what? With all due respect, I've collected the weed for two months, but now this business of me going to Boaz's apartment and uncovering his feet, Zayme Gesund, let someone else do that job. <laughs> she just follows because again, it is the humility in us that allows us a time to take on tasks that me, let someone else do it. Sometimes, yes, it's the small little things, the things that sometimes say, I'm embarrassed to say that, I'm embarrassed to do that. that, that's below my dignity. But sometimes that's exactly, precisely what allows us to really grow in the most beautiful way in personality and character, and maybe save the world in our own small way. It should never be below someone's dignity to do what they have to do. And moving forward is that sometimes allow ourselves to see there's a bigger picture here. There's nothing that's a coincidence. There's no such a thing. Divine providence, God recreates the universe every millisecond. If God is recreating the universe every millisecond, everybody, that means everything is happening every millisecond. So this is what I, this is, my personal, but I, I, I would like you quickly to share, I know it's the end of class, what you think we can get out of the Ross story. So like now I have another favorite person in my life, Ross, I love Queen Esther. I love so many of the women now in our storyline because it's just so powerful um, of, of what they do, like, like just thinking about it is, you know? Uh, and, and exactly this is who King David comes from. People like this, a Rus, a Boaz. Like Boaz could have been, he's 80 years old. He's a Shaifet. He's a, think of him. He's a, one of the wealthiest landovers. He could say, excuse me, Arois, go out. What do you think I am here? <laughs> he goes and he also has a humility in his acts. An arrogant man wouldn't, wouldn't listen. He'd say, send me a Shatchan, send me a matchmaker. How much is the dowry? <laughs> You know, I'm just trying to draw a more contemporary picture here. But he realizes. I, a, oh, one more, I forgot one more little point, Kim. That's why he says to her, I forgot to say this. This kindness is even greater than the other kindnesses that Lot's daughter did. And he's saying this, what you're doing now is the greatest kindness because it's going to allow me to fulfill my mission on earth. Forgot to mention, that's why he's saying it to her. Okay, sorry, Kim, what did you want to say? Wait, so... King David is how is he related to Ruth? Okay, so Ruth has a son with Boaz called Oved. They give right. Oved gives birth to a, a son called Jesse, Yishai. And Yishai, Jesse gives birth to King David. So she's his great great grandmother. And she lived to see him ascend to the throne, by the way. Wow. She see him ascend to the throne. Wait, how did she uh, get so connected to Judaism again, Ruth? Like, how did she convert? Because when, when Elimelech and his wife Naomi leave the land of Israel to go down to Moab because they're escaping the famine and they're trying to make a better life for themselves because they were very wealthy in Israel and they're, they're starting to lose their wealth. There's a famine. So they mortgage their lands. Boaz takes over the mortgage because he's next of kin. He acquires the land. They travel there. And Machlon and Kilian, the two boys, I don't know if they're hanging out in the where they're hanging out, but they meet the two princesses. Next week, we're going to discuss why would Arpa and Rus even marry them? Rus, we know why, but Arpa is they saw in these two Jewish boys a new light that they don't see among their own people, you know? It's, it's, it's exciting. Two foreigners, good-looking guys coming to Moab. So they marry them. It's, it's, it's a, they're, they're married. They marry the two brothers. Two sisters marry two brothers. That's how they end up with them. So Ruas is an authentic convert. Arpa goes back to the family life. Once, once poverty hits and Naomi's leaving, she said, yeah, she decides that she wants to stay home. She wants to go back to her Moabite <laughs> life. And that, you know, that's what we discussed at the beginning. Yes, Dory. If... If God, if Hashem um, is um, causing or um, 
ordering certain evolutionary events to take place, why does it have to be so complicated? Why can't it be simple? I just said that question. I gave it a hint for next week's class oh. that greatest light comes from sometimes the greatest darkness produces the greatest light. And I'm gonna, I don't wanna give away the whole class next week, but yes, that's exactly the question. That's what I said in the beginning. Why did it have to be complicated? We couldn't Boaz choose a nice Yiddish medal from Kvar Chabad, from Tel Aviv, from Ramad Gan, from Jerusalem, and get married and have King David that way. A Moabite princess, it's her lineage is questioning. She comes from Lot's daughter and sister's relationship. Gotten Himmel, could you give, give me a little bit less complicated here? <laughs> the greatest light comes from the greatest darkness. And why does that have to happen? Next week, we're going to discuss a concept based on Kabbalah and Hasidic Jewish mysticism. Why is it like that, Taka? You know, why is it that, that Taka? Like, yeah, why is it? So let me tell you a story and then we'll end up with a little joke here. So, uh, so uh, a rabbi is working in a shul for six months and he says to the, to the board, I'm quitting. Rabbi, why are you quitting? Tell us. We don't pay you enough? No, you pay me beautifully. You don't like the newly renovated parish house? No, I love the newly renovated parish house. You don't like us, the people? No, I love the people. Then why are you quitting? He says, because this is the first question you asked me in six months. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we have to ask questions. That's my point. So uh, we're going to count Svirasa Omer together, okay, which is uh, the, the Omer. And to be continued next Thursday, um, to be continued, um, we have to, I have to, uh, I'm trying, I have a bar mitzvah Thursday morning in the shul. So I'm going to, I might be sending out a new time for next Thursday. We're definitely going to have the class next Thursday, or maybe we should, we'll switch it to Wednesday just for next week. We're going to continue the story of Rus, of ARPA, you know, so bring your, your, your psychoanalysis book, because this is a real Sigmund Freud piece. <laughs> We're going to discuss why does King David have to come in such a controversial way. And we're also going to discuss more about the holiday of Shuas, the Ten Commandments or the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> Which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> And I want to end off with sphere accounting. So let me quickly open up my app. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hold on a second. Uh, okay. Count sphere. Bear with me. I'm usually open already, but I was reading something. Okay. Let's go. Okay. Sphere. Omer. Give me a second. Oh, Omer tools. Let's go. Count to Omer. Okay. It's May 6th, right? So previous day, hold on. Okay, ready everybody? We'll do it in Hebrew. Okay, Hayom. Hayom. Tisha. 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 Shloshim. Shloshim. Yom. 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 Shehem. Shehem. Hamisha. 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 Shavuot. 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 Yomim. Today is 39 days, which is five weeks and four days of the Omer. So we're almost by Shavuot, the holiday of the counting of the Torah. And today's uh, characteristics, like we discuss every time, is let me see, Netzach She Biyasod, which is, I'll play very quickly. 39, 39, 39. I love this book I told you about. It's the uh, characteristics of the Omer. Okay, quickly, and then I'll let everybody go. 39 is Netzach Shabahod, endurance and bonding. Okay, homework. Demonstrate the endurance level of your bonding by confronting a challenge that obstructs the bond. So an essential component of bonding is endurance. Its ability to withstand challenges and setbacks. Without endurance, there's no chance to develop true bonding. 
So question, am I totally committed to the one with who I bond? How much will I endure and be ready to fight to maintain that bond? Is the person with whom I bond aware of my devotion? I guess that's what Rus had to tell Boaz, that she was committed to him, <laughs> devoted to him. <laughs> okay. So that's what it means uh, in developing our character traits. So reminder tomorrow to light Shabbos candles 18 minutes before sunset, put a, a few pennies in tzedakah, and say a prayer for the 45 souls that passed on in Miron. And um, like we said, we don't know why. So silence is the only answer, but doing good, doing a mitzvah in their memory, giving tzedakah, saying a prayer in their memory, doing an act of goodness is our response, I think, than my own personal response, everybody. Have a good week. Any quick questions before we go? All right, so I will send out an email. It might be, maybe we'll do Wednesday next week, 10 to 11, because we have a bar mitzvah in the show. So Wednesday, 10 to 11 next week, God willing. Shalom, shalom. Roberta. Thank, 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 thank you very much. I'm, I'm not going to be able to attend next Wednesday because I teach in the morning, but this was very lovely. Thank you. Shalom. I look forward to joining some other room that you give. Good, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Be well, everybody.